Duckbill dinosaurs are among the most successful herbivores in the history of life on Earth. Their hundredfold tooth batteries are arguably the most complex in vertebrate evolution and were capable of crushing, grinding, and shearing, allowing them to capitalize on all sorts of plants, both near the ground and high above it. Unfortunately, these animals saw their biggest heyday at the very end of the Cretaceous period and likely would have continued to evolve into all sorts of bizarre forms had that pesky rock not knocked some sense into the planet. The hadrosaurs became so successful that they are thought to have outcompeted other herbivores in relation to evidence for declines of dinosaur diversity in North America and Central China. In addition, during the very last chunks of the Cretaceous period, hadrosaurs seem to have been the only dinosaurs from the Northern Hemisphere to have successfully colonized Southern Hemisphere continents. One species has been described from partial remains in Africa, and as many as five species have been named from Central and Northern Patagonia, where their remains are abundant. This opens interesting questions about the impact that hadrosaurs could have had on otherwise highly endemic dinosaur faunas of the Southern Hemisphere, and whether these faunas also experienced a decline in diversity right before the space rock attack. Southern Hemisphere hadrosaurs are most common in the northern regions of South America, and much rarer in the southern tip as well as Antarctica. The arrival of duck-billed dinosaurs into southern Patagonia and the Antarctic Peninsula is documented by unnamed partial remains that are currently assumed to belong to hadrosaurs, like those of central and northern Patagonia, but they don't provide much data. At the time, southern Patagonia and the Antarctic Peninsula were closer together than they are today. Keep in mind that the tip of Chile is the closest mainland to Antarctica. In the Cretaceous, there were intermittent land bridges that allowed faunal interchange to the isolated continent. These territories may have also become at least partially isolated from the rest of South America when sea levels rose and the ocean transgressed back upon the land. In 2013, a huge team of paleontologists from Chile, the UK, Spain, Brazil, Argentina, and Germany initiated excavation of a bone bed with abundant disarticulated remains from several individuals of a single species of sub-Antarctic duck-billed dinosaur. The site is of early Maastrichtian age, the last 6 million years of the late Cretaceous, and is located in the Rio de las Chinas valley of the Magallanes region of subantarctic Chile, at the southernmost tip of southern Patagonia. The fossils specifically come from Loma Coquen, El Puesto area, Rio de las Chinas Valley, Estancia Cerro Gaido, Magallanes region, Chilean Patagonia, from the upper section of the Dorotea Formation. The Dorotea Formation represents a transition between shallow marine and continental environments. Specifically, it has been interpreted as a transition from a shallow marine shelf edge to tide-dominated delta and fluvial systems. The Dorotea Formation mainly comprises greenish-gray and reddish-brown sandstones with abundant conglomerate and siltstone lenses, thin beds of sandy calcareous concretions, and mudstones of 900 to 1200 meter thickness. Along the succession, there are fossil-bearing levels with bivalves, ammonites, gastropods, sharks, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, frogs, turtles, dinosaurs, mammals, fossil wood, and leaves. The team found enough bones in this dig site to describe them as a new dinosaur, and their work was published in the journal Science Advances in June of 2023. The holotype of this new dinosaur, CPAP 3054, was a chunk of the right side of the hip found among the strewn about remains of many other individuals. The team found that this bone had the most amount of identifiable anatomical traits, so they chose it for the holotype, despite not being something like an entire skeleton or a nice skull. That being said, plenty paratypes were described based on all of those other bones, which included many bits of the skull, right jaw, some neck bone, some back vertebrae, some tail vertebrae, some ribs, chunks of sternum, four humeri, a scapula, two ulnae, a radius, a bunch of other hip chunks, four femur specimens, two tibiae, a fibula, and some toes. Once described, the team decided to name this new hadrosaur Gonkoken Nanoi. 
the words gan, same as or similar to, and goken, wild duck or swan, are in the language of the Ionikank or Tewelche, the indigenous people that inhabited the region where the species was found. The specific name Nanoi is in honor of Mario Nano Yoa, who first found dinosaur fossils at Rio de las Chinas Valley and provided key logistic help during the expeditions. When all of the fossils from the multiple individuals are corrected for size, missing fossils are filled in from close relatives and from the rule of symmetry, this is the dinosaur we get. To those unfamiliar with hadrosaur biology, this thing looks underwhelming or boring. However, it's the specific details of its anatomical traits that make it as important to the understanding of hadrosaur evolution as it is. Gonko Ken had a blunt, low-sloped skull, ending in a beak that was small compared to other hadrosaurs and without a known, noticeable head crest. Gonko Ken ran about atop two stilt-like forelimbs and two robust hindlimbs. It had a high, rigid spine made up of numerous neural spines, akin to many other hadrosaurs. Before we move on to what it is and why it's important, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get an idea of how Gonko Ken stacks up against one of us. When everything is in its place, the largest individual at the dig site is estimated to be about 4 meters 13 feet in length. They may have grown larger than this, but since there is no proof of that, the smaller estimate based on the largest known individual is what we have to go on. So, it seems that Gonko Ken was not a particularly large hadrosaur. Thanks, Mr. Man. Gonko Ken is a duckbilled dinosaur that shares traits of true hadrosaurids of the late Cretaceous, as well as primitive traits of members of the Hadrosauroidea from the early and mid Cretaceous, making it most likely a bizarre lineage of primitive hadrosauroids that survived into the end of the Cretaceous to convergently evolve advanced features alongside the true hadrosaurids. To properly address the relationships of Gonko Ken, the research team carried out the most comprehensive phylogenetic analysis of duck-billed dinosaurs to date using a data matrix from a recent study, which was modified to correct for some things as well as include additional critters like Gobi Hadros and Wewekanatlus, which are important transitional forms between other hadrosauroids and the true hadrosaurids. The results of these tests places Gonko Ken outside of Hadrosauridae, but among transitional duckbills that are closest to this family, such as the Mexican Wewekanautlus and Alabaman Laforathon, which are its closest relatives. These three dinosaurs are therefore likely most relevant to understanding the origins of Hadrosauridae. However, Laforathon and Wewekanautlus are represented by very partial remains. Gonko Ken provides more information, which is also bound to increase upon future excavations at the bone bed. Gonko Ken is not particularly related to other South American duckbills, which are advanced forms of the family Hadrosauridae. Recent work has proposed that all other South American duckbills are Sauralophene hadrosaurids, forming a natural, related group that is the sister to the Critosaurini, a tribe that inhabited Lermidia, the western continent of Cretaceous North America. This means that all South American hadrosaurids, aside from Gonkoken, descend from a single species that dispersed into South America. Despite these South American Sauralophene hadrosaurs being related to the Critosaurines, they cannot be put into that basket. So the Gonko Ken team came up with a new label, the Austrocritosauria. However, Gonko Ken cannot be placed in this grouping, meaning it represents a whole different lineage of ancient duckbill that independently colonized South America. As it happens, Gonko Ken is also one of the most complete and is the most informative hadrosaur so far found from the southern regions. This means it can now help to reinterpret the record of partial duckbill fossils from southern Patagonia and Antarctica. Partial remains in these regions can no longer be assumed to belong to true hadrosaurids like those of central and northern Patagonia. None of these remains have traits that are exclusive to hadrosaurids, especially when the hadrosaurid-like features of Gonko Ken are considered. A tooth of a hadrosaurid was found in Antarctica, but teeth aren't known from the South American hadrosaurs it would have been related to, and no teeth are known from Gonko Ken, so this tooth may belong to any type of hadrosaur. 
two-tailed vertebrae are known from Argentina and were thought to be from a hadrosaurid, but the traits of these bones are seen in Gonko Ken, a non-hadrosaurid hadrosaur. So, hadrosaurids may have never reached into the Magallanes Austral Basin or further south, where no remains can be reliably attributed to hadrosauridae. This may add to other animal differences that have been noticed between the fossil record of southern and northern Patagonia. Gonkoken is the first non-hadrosaurid duckbill dinosaur ever found in the southern hemisphere, so its presence so far south poses a challenging biogeographic enigma. Any explanation implies remarkably long routes, large gaps in between, with no records of non-hadrosaur duckbills and marine barriers that stopped most northern hemisphere dinosaurs. Most likely, these marine barriers could have been breached through chains of islands rather than continuous land bridges, meaning any landlubbers had to swim or raft to disperse. The first American biotic exchange between North America and South America is thought to have started during the latest Cretaceous. Mammals of North American origin had already become diverse in South America in the early Paleocene, suggesting that they must have crossed over earlier. However, no remains have yet been found in the Cretaceous of South America. Currently, the most reliable fossil evidence of exchanges during the Cretaceous is provided by the Austrocritosauria with other evidence also provided by Patagopelta, a possible notosaurid from Patagonia, and the large North American titanosaur Alamosaurus with potential ancestry in South America. Therefore, if the ancestors of Gonko Ken were from North America, they could have followed a similar route. A radically different possibility is that the ancestors of Gonko Ken were European, dispersing into Africa and from there into South America. This is a much longer route that also implies crossing two marine barriers rather than one. Although possible exchanges through this route have been argued to be better supported than those between the Americas, based on numerous shared biotic components between Europe and South America during the latest Cretaceous. Whatever the case may be, duck-billed dinosaurs had the highest capacity for dispersing to new lands out of any dinosaurs aside from birds and proto-birds, with the greatest number of dispersal events that likely crossed marine barriers, namely between Asia and Laramidia, Appalachia and Laramidia twice, Europe and Appalachia, Asia and Europe twice, Europe and North Africa, Laramidia and South America, and South America and Antarctica. Duck-billed dinosaurs are also most often preserved near or within coastal environments and have been suggested to be apt swimmers or even semi-aquatic. Based on some phylogenetic and biogeographic software and maths, the Gonko Ken team conclude that Gonko Ken is likely descended from North American non-hadrosaurids that are transitional to hadrosauridae, the likes of Eotrachodon, Lophorothon, and Huehuecanatlus. These were also the last non-hadrosaurids of North America, where they became replaced by true hadrosaurids. Non-hadrosaur duckbills are absent in the abundant and well-studied record of North American dinosaurs of the latest Campanian and Maastrichtian, strongly suggesting that they really did die out locally. However, at some point before that, the non-hadrosaur ancestors of Gonkoken managed to leave North America, surviving into the Maastrichtian as distant relict populations in sub-Antarctic Chile. Given that Gonkoken is found so far south and that hadrosaur remains cannot be confirmed from sub-Antarctic and Antarctic regions, this pattern suggests the ancestors of Gonkoken arrived earlier into South America than the hadrosaurids, giving the former a head start in reaching more southern regions. Hadrosaurids, in turn, may have not had enough time to reach this far south before the cave pig mass extinction. Another reason to suspect that hadrosaurids may have never arrived into subantarctic and antarctic regions is that they tended to replace non-hadrosaurids in those regions where they coexisted. The niches of hadrosaurids likely overlapped onto those of non-hadrosaur duckbills that were often smaller sized and had smaller tooth plates with fewer tooth positions, taking up a smaller proportion of the jaw. 
Given the importance of the tooth jaw apparatus, this could explain why the Mastrichtian non hadrosaur duckbills had disappeared in North America, while a single species is known from Asia. Non hadrosaur duckbills like Telmatosaurus persisted into the Mastrichtian in Europe, but this is probably because they were isolated island dwellers. This is also a feasible explanation for Gonko Ken, given evidence of marine transgression events and an archipelago at the time in southern South America. Controversy Now we must bring up the controversy that popped up soon after this paper was published. Toshiro Jujihara, a Magellanic PhD student at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, has notified on their Facebook, My work has been plagiarized and has been published recently by the co-authors. I will keep it short because the issue seems to have sorted itself out, maybe? This guy said he was plagiarized, and then the paleontological network of the University of Chile made a public statement saying, In view of slanderous and unfounded accusations made through social networks by a former collaborator, the paleontological network of the University of Chile hereby categorically denies the existence of plagiarism or any other lack of scientific ethics, and we inform that the publication in question is the result of an extensive research and rigorous peer review process, following all ethical standards and validated in multiple instances. There is no coincidence of wording or appropriation of any intellectual creation since all information collection, analysis, and documentation used is our own. Following standard ethical procedures regarding former contributors and using institutional channels, this former contributor was repeatedly invited to participate as a co-author of our publication. Despite explaining this standard procedure and making explicit our intention to move forward with the publication, we never received any response from the former collaborator or the authorities of his institution in Germany. Following the corresponding academic procedures, all the necessary information will be made available to the institutional authorities in order to clear up any doubts. Notwithstanding the above, we reserve the right to take legal action against those who, through unfounded accusations, affect the dignity and honor of the authors of our publication. Sincerely yours, Paleontological Network of the University of Chile. So, it seems like it was all nonsense? I don't know, but I thought it was something I should bring up. That about ends it for Gonko Ken, though. A cool little duckbill. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.